if anyone ever asks me like what my goal is in life, I always say I just want to be proud of myself because I'm convinced that anything else will come from that. If I'm proud of myself, then I'm likely doing the things that will make me successful or happy or at peace or more specifically have a top podcast or sell a million books. Like I will likely get to that if I'm proud of myself. Case, thank you for coming on the show, man. Thanks for having me. Really grateful and honored for you to be here, considering that in 2021, a girl from a hinge date was, I was on the phone with her and she said, you know who you remind me of? Case Kenny. And then for you to be on the podcast is quite hilarious. It's a full circle moment. I like that. It's so funny. that That's a positive, uh, a positive moment. I remember a moment similar to that. That's like the flip side of that. I got a message from a guy once and he was so angry with me. Um, he was like, screw you, blah, blah, blah. He's like, my girlfriend listens to your podcast and she broke up with me because of something you said, or you, you planted an idea in her head and then she evaluated our relationship and broke up with me. And she, he was obviously very upset. He didn't know who I was, but he was upset with me because she referenced me in breaking up with him, which doesn't seem fair to drag me into it. But anyway, I just think it's like the flip side of that. Like it's a nice, <laughs> a nice moment to be virtually connected uh, in a way we didn't put together until years later. Well, have you ever gotten messages of the actual reverse of like i'm with my boyfriend or girlfriend because of yeah sure. yeah yeah yeah, yeah I've, I've had a couple where like they both listened to my podcast and that like brought them together or something it is crazy the world the world is crazy that you could have a, a not a role in someone's relationship but like uh, you could be the commonality between them and then they could put that together and that could be a bonding moment or something like that it's that's the gift of podcasting what do you think about your show allows that to happen exactly uh, I don't know, man. Oh, I think for one, I think my share, my show is like shareable in a sense. Cause it's easy to be like, Hey, listen to this is 15 minutes on two X speed. It's seven minutes. Like who can't spare seven minutes? So I think that helps. Um, but also I think for me, like I really try to simp like my whole thing with the podcast and my life, frankly, is trying to simplify my life, I'm trying to move slower, be patient, build big, but do it at a, at a pace that makes sense and just simplify things, simplify myself, simplify my inner life, simplify my outer life, everything. And so when it comes to the, the podcast and the things I do, I will take one point, a super, super simple point, a cliche point. You deserve to be loved, for instance. And I will beat that point up for 15 minutes so that when you leave, you're like, man, the guy, homie kind of repeated himself a lot. But actually, you know, that that was now I'm like really thinking about it. So that just simplify, not a million different points and like pulling this and that in. And that's a great way to podcast. But for me, it's just like simplify guy because i used to really like be averse to cliches and i'm like i'm not going to state a cliche but then i realized cliches are true and they're true if you can break them down with logic and relatability and experience and that's just what i i just do hundreds of times and i think i think people appreciate it yeah well clearly yeah. they do from the numbers but what's yeah. crazy is like the similarities in our stories because when i saw and looked at people putting themselves out there online i was like ah, uh, that's cringe or, ah, uh, that's so, and obviously that's like the deepest thing yeah. inside me. Yeah. And it feels like a very similar thing from your perspective of like your own journey with podcasting. Yeah. 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 That we, we do have that in common for sure. I mean, so I worked in sales for a long time before and while I built the podcast and my sales identity was very at odds with what I do now. Cause now I say two things as a joke. I say, I share my feelings for a living as a joke, which I think is funny and it is accurate. It's literally what I do. I share my feelings for a living. And then I also joke that I do arts and crafts for a living because I'm literally writing on pieces. I have a, I have a paper chopper in my apartment, what kind of man as a paper chopper. I've got, you know, glue sticks and post-it notes and, you know, whatever. Um, and that's very at odds with who I used to be from a masculine perspective, but also professionally very at odds with being a salesperson. I was a manager of a team. I managed like 12 people uh, advertising technology sales where it's like, you know, you're type A, we're hustlers, we're going out and we're doing this and we're doing that. And if you're not making this amount of money, you're a loser, like that whole thing. Not that I bought into it completely, but that was a lot of pressure. So to be like, Hey, uh, just FYI, I'm, you know, don't pay me my commission check. Cause I'm, I'm quitting to go share my feelings for a living was very at odds. And I thought it was cringe for a while. And I had some people that I was close with that I thought I was close with that would like clown on me and make fun of me. And, um, it really made me not only second guess myself, but have a little bit of imposter syndrome, um, as I think everyone does. But yeah, it's been a complete 180 from that to this. And, you know, the, my girlfriend always says, she always has the phrase, I don't think it's hers, but she always says, you know, you're cringe, but you're free. And I would much rather be free and cringy 
than, you know, watered down and in some kind of, you know, title or job or relationship where I, where I was just avoiding that. Uh, so I think, you know, being willing to be the guy who's cringy, who's sensitive, who's vulnerable, that guy who writes quotes on the internet, screw it. I like, I've stepped into that. Um, and that's been rewarding. What, at least. yeah. What was the reaction like when, from the people around you who knew you as the salesperson? Uh, it was surprising because I've never, I've never been a wellness guy. I've never been a self-help guy. I've never been people. I've never been the guy who was like, man, go talk to case. Like he's, he's going to really help settle you down. I am now in the sense that, so I started the podcast for me. Like my whole thing was like, I started for me when I was 28, I got out of a relationship. I was frustrated with my job. I was like, I want to answer these questions, start the podcast, very meta thing. And then what I realized through the podcast was I was practicing mindfulness and mindfulness is a muscle that the more you practice it, literal the literally the better you get at it for yourself of course number one like the podcast is my therapy but two and then you, you talk a lot you write a lot you get better at delivering a message you can't help but help other people so i think initially people are like you're doing what you're talking you're giving dating advice and you're single so it was a very anachronistic type positioning but eventually i think people started to realize that you know i was good at it and it was helping people most importantly and people were supporting me and it kind of just snowballed from there. And then you had the stupid thing like social media presence and like you get a blue check and people are like, okay, maybe he is good, which I hate that fact, but this is life for you. Um, but yeah, I think at a certain point I was like, yeah, I am I am that guy and I do it. And because I used to really downplay it, I'd be like, oh, that little thing, no, I don't really care about that, even though I did care about that. And I think that's such an L looking back to like deny something that you're passionate about because you didn't want to come off a certain way to a couple people. That's an L. Um, but the W, uh, is having stepped fully into it. And it's so rewarding, truly free in every sense. When did you feel like you fully stepped into it? On the honest answer is when I quit my job a year and a half ago. I mean, that a is a year and a half ago. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. I it was successful yeah. before then. I was talking to someone about this yesterday. I'm very passionate about it about. Yeah. So I, yeah, I mean, I worked at this job for eight years and then, uh, I mean, four years, four years into it, I started the podcast. So I did the podcast alongside the job for a long, long time. Um, and it was successful. I remember the first month, random number, but I it always stuck with me. The first month I got 56,000 downloads, which is a lot if you're a first time podcaster, yes. truly. Um, and then it only, you know, increased from there. And about a year in, yeah, I was doing really well. I could have easily left my job um, and I didn't. And I'm smart in some ways and I'm not smart in other ways. But the one thing I will give myself credit for is having a little bit of foresight into the fact that I never want to make business or career or content decisions or creative decisions without leverage. And financial security is leverage because I knew what would happen if I had quit that job, which I did well at it. I was in my you know early 30s, having worked at this job for a long time. I did well is in sales. Um, I knew that if I had quit and did the podcast full time, I knew I would have started taking on any brand that would throw me money, taking, doing any, literally anything to make money. And I knew it wouldn't have come from a place of leverage where I could say no, because I want to focus on the impact, uh, the, the creative elements or like what's true to me. So I waited a long time until I could be like, I could, I could make no money for the, from this for two years if I wanted to, and still be okay because I had saved for so long. And that was the final moment a year and a half ago. I was like, I'm, I'm going to leave and do this full time. And I just found a lot of peace and patience and like building from there because I wasn't like quit and be like, all right, I've got enough in the bank for a month. So I need to create this product or take this deal or do this brand deal. That it, and then that's like served me really well of being like really stubborn and like always having leverage, like personal leverage, financial leverage to make decisions that like are true to me and my creative vision. And what would you say is the biggest thing that's made you feel more comfortable in your own skin? in the last three years? Ugh. Man, well, I mean, I feel like my relationship with myself has evolved. So like the the whole purpose of the podcast has fulfilled itself and that I did the podcast to find answers, right? I did it to help myself grow and evolve uh, and be a better man. And I would say objectively I am. I feel like I've grown so much 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 over the past couple of years. So you can't help but feel more in your skin when than when you grow. Um, Two, but two, I, you know, I, I can't deny that when people support me, it feels good. Like I have, uh, you know, being in Chicago, you know, people stop me all the time because from there, built the base there, wear the same thing every day. I'm somewhat recognizable in like 
downtown area. So people stop me all the time. Be like, hey, listen to your podcast. You're amazing. This like weird stuff. You know, there's times where I would bump into someone. I remember right before I moved here, I was walking on the street and this girl, we were stopped at a light together, just walking in the crosswalk. And she didn't say anything. She just tapped me on my shoulder and held up her phone and went like that. And it was my podcast. She was listening to the podcast as she was walking on. She was like, hey, that's just so freaking cool. So stuff, stuff like that, as, as much as like you obviously can't hang your validation on other people's validation, it does certainly help. But the podcast has always been for me, and you can't help but grow after doing it 473 times and then turning it into books and products that sell and, you know, you can make a living from it. Um, you know, it just, it feels good to be introspective. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like when you create content, at least in the way that we do, it's like, it almost forces you to look at yourself. What do you value? What do you care about? Not for everyone. People who create content in different ways doesn't necessarily mean that they have to look at themselves. But when you do it in our style, in our way, it kind of forces you to look at yourself and understand yourself better yeah i mean that's my whole thing like i really only try to talk about topics that i've gone through i'm going through i have a close connection with like so it forces me to keep my introspection personal as opposed to talking about theoretical things or whatever maybe like people dm me requests all the time like talk about dating with kids or talk about divorce like i don't know and it feels a little disingenuous that i would try to address that so I really try to keep it tight to my own life and I'm 34, so still feel really, really young, but also I've got some, some sizable meat there that I can reference and, you know, keeping it personal has been, you know, it helps and, you know, it grows, it grows me and it, you know, grows my relationship with other people because it creates that relatability. So it's a win-win to be authentic, which is a cliche, but it's true. Yeah. It's like kind of like you're young enough to have gone through some stuff, but old enough to have some of the wisdom that comes with the lessons learned. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's like an interesting spot in your life, like 34 years. Old. Yeah. Honestly, that's a good point. It's like the perfect time because you're still, you're still relatable to, to Gen Z and millennials. Of course, you could still stay hip with the lingo if you're, if you're trying to, uh, but yeah, you've got enough experience, but you also still have enough question marks in life. So you're not old and, you know, jaded or whatever for hyperbole sake. Like you're still in it. You're still in the game. You're still growing. You're still moving. You're still making decisions. You can still move to Miami if you want. Like, cool shit like that so yeah that's good that's a good point how old are you 27 so <laughs> bro perfect <laughs> what <Perfect. laughs> when are some of the things that 27 year olds should look out for in the next seven years to make the most of their time in this floating rock and space oh man I, 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 a lot i mean i think the thing that i'm really hot on lately uh is two things uh both are driven by cliches but both i think are so incredibly true and that would be cliches of of gratitude for one the soundbite that i keep coming back to in my life that i struggle with and i would probably venture to guess that you struggle with it too as a driven person is the soundbite is as follows the absence of what i want does not negate the presence of what i have namely you know you could want more but we need to appreciate what we have in the moment like having things that we haven't achieved still pursuing the person we want to become it doesn't cancel out everything we have everything we have grown to have everything we've evolved through like we need to have some appreciation and gratitude for getting to this place because otherwise as entrepreneurs or driven people or curious people we will always be moving the goalposts further and we'll, we'll literally never be happy and i know that's like such a you know well wellness soundbite but it is so freaking true i have this bottle of champagne in my apartment i've God, it was, it was the Virgil Abloh edition uh, of a champagne. Ace so, of Spades? I, I honestly, I can't remember. That's why I didn't say the brand. Let's call it the Ace of Spades Virgil edition. So it was a nice, nice, expensive bottle of champagne, you know, celebrity brand, whatever. I bought it years ago. I'm thinking 2017, something like that, 2018. And I've had it for that long, haven't touched it. But I remember buying, when I bought it, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop this when I sell my first 10,000 books or whatever. And I've far lap that and i did it fairly soon or whatever close to when i bought it and every single time i hit my goal i'm like eh, you know what's cooler than ten thousand a hundred thousand you know what's cooler than a hundred thousand half a million million so on and so forth i've i've never touched it because i keep moving the the goal post for that business objective and i've never touched it and i also do that in my personal life oh i'll be i'll be more grateful and at peace and i'll move slower once i've done this or i feel this way or i even crazy stuff like once i hit this pr in the gym like weird finish lines and i think that's a relatable topic and that we all we hang our hat on those things and we're not present in the way that we've evolved to get that thing so i think for 27 year old me it's 
it's find a way to do that, whether through a mantra, like the absence of the present, the absence of what I want does not negate the presence of what I have or whatever it may be. Try to stay rooted in something like that. And I think, uh, I think you'll only benefit from it because looking back, you can't, can't go back and create more memories. You can't go back and create gratitude and like regrets a topic that really motivates me. Um, cause you can't, can't change the past. So I, I would start with that. Well, it's funny because if you're 60 years old and you have all the money in the world, what do you want? You want just to be back at 34, yeah. Yeah. 27. Like that's the thing that you would give all the money up to experience. Yeah. And we get to experience this moment right here. Yeah. And it's like, well, in some ways we are wealthier than the 60 year old or 70 year old or 80 year old. And that is something that I think young people don't think enough about. A hundred percent. And one of my, like. I try to get a lot of perspective for the podcast. So I'm talking about relatable things. I'm bringing in perspective to amplify my own. And one of the things I do a lot is I like to ask older generations questions, of course, as a lot of people do. And I always ask the question of what do you regret in life? Um, and usually I, I couch this in the context of, of relationships. Um, and I always give this example, but it ties to that. And I've when I ask these people, you know, 60 plus, they hear a ton of answers of what they regret. And the answer I always hear is a version of rushing. Uh, usually it's in the context of a relationship. I regret rushing into a relationship, staying in a relationship for too long, dating the wrong people, thinking that a relationship defined me, so on and so forth. And I usually talk about this in the context of our aversion to being single, but it plays here nicely as well as impatience and rushing and trying to make your life look good on paper or look good to other people. It, it is such a zero sum game. Like we can't, we can't win at that because there'll always be something else. There'll always be an additional box and I think we just need to fight that intentionally. Be driven. Like I'm the world's most impatient driven person, but I think mindfulness can be something that isn't always delicate and nice. It's 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 powerful. It's 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 stand up and shout it and be like, no, I am going to decide that this moment is a core memory. As we're sitting here in this room, I'm gonna lock this in. I'm not gonna think about something else I have to do. I'm just gonna decide. And then it's that way. So I, I think sometimes having that like type A mentality towards your life. Um, even though it doesn't sound as soft as mindfulness, like that you associate with mindfulness, I think it's very helpful. I love that. Why are more men having less sex than ever before? <laughs> oh, is that a statistic? Yeah. yeah. Like it's on the rise tremendously. Yeah. Pablo, video king Pablo will put it up on the screen here. The statistic of Interesting. more men being sexless than ever before. Why huh. is that the case from what you learned and experienced about dating and relationships from your perspective. Interesting. Well, I would I would throw out two theories. Um, I would throw out two theories. I don't know where they would be on the spectrum. I'd say for one, perhaps men have found other things that are engaging in their lives, business building, hobbies, creative outlets, where it's, you know, it's not uh, as important to them. That's a theory. The second theory, which I'm sure my following would love because my following is mostly women, is that women are fed up with men's bullshit and they're not giving sex to the men that want it as often, uh, the men that are, you know, uh, just out for sex, for recreational sex, perhaps that would be uh, an idea. Um, I don't know. Uh, I have I have heard in like Japan, a lot of men aren't having sex. I didn't realize it had reached had reached over to North America. What have you? What are the findings of it? Do you know? Well, a couple of things. I mean, there's like social media. You get dopamine from. You get dopamine from video games mm -hmm. you get dopamine from sex from porn porn yeah. and so you porn video games yeah. and social media it's like huh. people can have all their needs met yeah. psychologically yeah. and men don't need to go out and meet women as much if they have all their meet yeah. needs met and that and also you have the issue of women seeking out partners who are slightly more competent than themselves in education the problem is that women are outpacing men in education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're seeking for a partner who is more educated than them. Naturally, that's like what they're trying, biologically trying to do. But then they don't find as many of them. Yeah. So then they have trouble figuring out where to go next. Huh. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, the the porn comment is relevant, of course. Um, you know, for men fulfilling that that need in, in other ways. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting comment as well. I was talking to someone the other day about that as a topic related to the men in general, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think those are, those are juicy topics. Well, it's, it's funny. Cause I think from how I view you and Alex Cooper is like <laughs> very similar. And this is why men go to Alex Cooper because they want to learn about 
how women view sex. Yeah. And women go to you because they want to know how does a guy view emotions. Yeah. Do you see that? I, I, <laughs> I've never heard that, but yeah, I could I could appreciate that for one. That's that's uh, I love that, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it's yeah, a lot of uh women do kind of like say I'm refreshing when it comes to that. Um, you know, being open and honest and like trying like I have done a couple episodes recently of like trying my best as a man to present what men want, what men feel, what is, you know, I don't I don't really like conversations around like what's the difference between men and women, but at least like peeling back the the mind of of a man in in 2023 and like what that means. So uh, I, I can see that as a fair comparison. Although, yeah, Alex's podcast is more, you know, gluck, gluck, 5,000 or whatever, whatever the heck it is. Uh, the kudos to her. I mean, she's done a great job. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's, it's just funny that it's like the opposite sex goes to yeah. that person yeah, yeah. for something that they want to feel. Yeah. And that they want to know, you know, an inside scoop at. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think for a lot of, you know, women listen to my pods, they, they, they want to, they want a message of, of hope that, you know, the, the, the man, the men that I describe, the men that do exist, that they are out there and, you know, here's maybe what they look like, or here's, you know, a, a mindset to, to use to, to find that man. I think, you know, I joke that I'm a delusional optimist. Um, that's why we get along. And about it, you think it's delusional. It's a choice. It's like, why wouldn't I choose to be optimistic and not like in a dangerous way or not, and certainly not in like a toxic positivity way not my vibe. I just think mindfulness is a tool where you can go through your life and you can go through your memories and you can go through your present and you can find support for optimism. Just as you could find support for pessimism, you could find support for optimism. And that's what I try to do. I do a lot of like uh, leadership sessions and, and mindfulness sessions. And basically what I do for 60 minutes is we'll come up with a claim like I deserve this or I want this or this is my standard. And we'll go through our memory banks and find proof of why that's true. Because the second you could find proof of something, um, it doesn't mean it's necessarily true, of course, but that is what creates the bond between a, a belief and a, and a perspective and a vision for the future. So when it comes to positivity, you could easily go through your memory bank and say, well, here's where I was ghosted or here's where my business failed. And you can support the opposite or you could find the opposite to support the opposite. It, it's a choice and it doesn't have to be all, you know, fairy tales, butterflies and rainbows. You can You can find the memories that support it and the experiences and you can use that lens to look to the future and that's the one i choose and that's the one i encourage people to choose um it fits them well it's funny because the our minds naturally go to the negative because the negative is the tiger in the forest who could kill us yeah. and so yeah. so when you know that about your own biases it allows you to say oh well if i know my bias is to look and seek out for the negative how come why can't i flip that why yeah. can't that be something different yeah yeah and i think i think a a lot of mindfulness, of course, is answering the question of why. Why do we do that? Why do we go to the negative so quickly? And it's what you described. It's it's a preservation tactic. It's to, 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 to prevent future harm. But I think we also need to be more honest. Like, yes, it's true. We are doing it to protect ourselves. But with like more honesty, it's like not only are we doing it to protect ourselves, we're doing it in order to not experience bad things twice. Because most fears come from an initial time where we were hurt, ghosted, failed, whatever it may be. And we don't want to repeat that. So we double down on protection. We double down on comfort in order to avoid it. And so it's like, okay, so if that's the truth, if the truth is we're, we're trying to avoid pain twice, discomfort twice, frustration twice, betrayal twice, you know, we think about how, I think a lot about like how that then translates into other beliefs. Well, then we also tend to flip to the opposite of that, which is like, we don't believe good things can happen twice in our life. Like if we had someone special and then we broke up, if we had a good couple of years in our career and then we fell down it's like we do the very human thing where we say well good things can't happen twice again so like i just i really do think mindfulness is very logical and has flip sides to it where it's like why can't we identify what the flip side is and choose that and then find support of it and use that to go create more versions of it like the example i always give is um you know the idea of murphy's law which is you know if the worst can happen it will happen and it's going to happen to you and it's going to happen to you often it's like the idea of a spectrum, zero to 100. Zero is the Murphy's Law, the worst case scenario of what can happen to you. But if there's a worst case scenario, then in some land, there has to be a best case scenario. There has to be a 100. Like, can we at least identify what it is and say it's on the menu instead of only saying this is possible? And I know this sounds lofty and frankly, 20s case would be like, oh, that's stupid. But we can't deny that our perception and interpretation of the world dictates our reality. It 
100% does. And if we could at least just put outcomes on the table, on the menu, it's on the menu. I think we're much more likely to go out and have actions that will create luck for us or meet people or randomness or whatever it may be. Uh, I think that that kind of thinking is very practical and action oriented. Because at the end of the day, if you're not acting on mindfulness, it's pretty much useless. So it has to fuel actions. And I think if you could start leaning into the power of opposites, the power of contrast, the power of logical opposites, then it's a win and your actions will follow suit. I love that. How do you recommend people pride themselves to be more lucky in the day? Oh, man. Uh, well, luck is an interesting topic. Um, I did a I did a pod uh, on this book, which off the top of my head, don't remember it. It's called the the role of like novelty in life. Um, and it was basically written by this this biochemist who, uh, you know, he's he's a guy in a in a white lab coat in a in a lab. He's doing he's doing science stuff way over my head. I don't even know, uh, like biochemistry and stuff. He's he's inventing penicillin and and curing cancer and stuff. But he wrote a whole book on how luck has played a tremendous role in in science. Um, and that some of the greatest inventions, penicillin being one, uh, Louis Pasteur, pasteurization being another one, it was lucky. They were just combining shit in the lab and got lucky. Um, but it, it's not blind luck. And he basically wrote the whole book on how there's four different types of luck. The first one is blind luck, which is random and, you know, we can't control it. And, but that's the kind of luck that we all uh, prescribe to our lives. Like we'll say, I'm not a lucky person. What we're describing is blind luck. But when it comes to the other types of luck, um, I'm kind of summarizing this guy, but I did a whole episode on it because I've seen it to be so true in our life. There are three other kinds of luck that we absolutely can control. And I think identifying them is so important because if you're in a headspace of saying, I'm not a lucky person, well then, yeah, you're not a lucky person because you're not going to do actions that might make you a lucky person. So off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember the different types of luck. The first type of luck is luck that comes from being in motion. The more you're in motion, the more you bump into other people who are also in motion. Motion could be sending a DM. It could be sending an email. It could be introducing yourself to someone on the street. It's literally just doing shit. The more you do shit, the, the more lucky you get. Luck from motion. Can't deny that. Um, the other type of luck was um, basically luck from experience. The more memories you have, the more experience you have, the more you're able to create patterns in your head and identify patterns and associations in the present. So a lot of the people in their lab, they're like, man, you know, I'm sitting here beating my head. I can't figure out how to create pasteurization. And he's like, well, maybe I remember this one thing. Maybe I should try this. That association, he spotted a pattern, is what made him lucky because he tried in the past, which also comes from motion. And then the last one was luck that comes from uniqueness. The more unique you are, the more you lean into what makes you you, your talent, your looks, whatever it may be, it creates luck. Silly example of you know, your blue hair creates a conversation in the elevator. You talk to someone, you end up doing business with them. Being your real self uh, in most contexts is more attractive than being a fake person. And that brings the right partner into your life, so on and so forth. So uh, I think that might answer your question when it comes to luck. Uh, but I mean, I think it really does show the the value of action. I think a lot of times we, we think that we can sink ourselves into outcomes, into luck, into success. And obviously that's not true. Um, but I think we can give ourselves more momentum than we when we think with small actions, with showing up for 250 some episodes, 400 some episodes, you know, flying, doing all these kinds of things. Like you can put yourself in a position to get lucky. Absolutely. I love that. Why do you think on that first piece of the luck in motion, why do you think that most people don't reach out? Don't they feel uncomfortable to approach a stranger? They feel uncomfortable to send a DM or or even like as simple as a confident person in my own life who I won't put on blast on this podcast, but like they, they have a business and they were unwilling to comment to random strangers on the internet about things that their business was about. And it just blew my mind. Cause I was like, this person's confident. This person should be able to do this, but they can't reach out to a stranger on the internet about something that they're interested in because they don't feel comfortable doing yeah. it. So it's like, a common thing that happens even with people who are confident. Yeah. So why don't why don't people reach out? Why do people feel comfortable making the first move? Well, I mean, I'd say the obvious answer is rejection. I think fear of rejection is debilitating. And like your example is great because I've seen it so often. Some of the most confident people I know are also the most insecure. They have very confident moments that you see and you associate with them, but deep down they're very insecure. It doesn't make them bad people, of course, and they're trying their best. Um, and sometimes it comes out in bright and shiny ways, but for the most part, they're insecure because 
likely something happened in their past and they don't want it to happen again. So they are doubled down on their safe space and their comfort zone and they don't ever want that to be to happen again. And of course that's human. I'm probably the same way too. Like I don't want it. Like why why would I why would I want to put myself in a position to be hurt unless the potential reward is so great. Not just good, but so great. Right. So I think it's very normal. I talk a lot about, particularly within the context of dating, speaking up, speaking your intention, asking a question, what are we, things like that, or in business. Like we are so averse to it. We as humans, we to my point, we have to incentivize ourselves so fully that we're willing to be hurt because the outcome is so rewarding to ourselves. But again, we can talk ourselves out of that so much. So I don't have a silver bullet for that. All I know is that when it comes to the words we say, the questions we ask, the shots we shoot, you get one of two things. And you're guaranteed to get one of two things. You're guaranteed to get the answer you want or the answer you need. And the answer you need is likely no, and it's likely rejection, and it's likely disappointment. But at least, particularly within dating, because I do talk a lot about dating, but it definitely goes beyond it. Within that context, you're guaranteed to win because you're not hovering in space. You're not living in this gray, ambiguous zone. You either get the answer you want, which is yes, I reciprocate, yes, let's do a podcast together, yes, let's do business together, or you get no, in which case you can hopefully save your energy and place it elsewhere or in a relationship, of course, move on. But it's a win for both, but you have to have the the thick enough skin, of course, to to take the the L in that in that place. And I, like for my life, I like as lame as it sounds, like I try to gamify things and I've, I've always leaned on the idea of points, like, um, awkward points. I did an episode, like episode 100 or something on, on awkward points. And that anytime I do something that I deem as awkward or embarrassing, walking up, saying something, raising my hand in class, volunteering to go first, whatever, I give myself an awkward point just to visualize filling my cup with something that cashes in for something because awkward points give you confidence. Confidence only, 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 you can't think of yourself in the confidence. Confidence comes from embarrassing moments or from moments where you went for it and it wasn't embarrassing, but it comes from action solely. So again, idea of incentivizing yourself, I find visualization helps your, your, sl- your it's like a county fair. You're, you're getting tickets for a teddy bear. You're at least putting yourself in a position. I do the same for like deeper emotions, like disappointment. Disappointments an emotion no one wants to experience, of course, but also disappointment is also an experience, uh, an emotion that a lot of people really live their lives in order to not experience. So in the moments where I do feel disappointment, I'm like, well, this really sucks, but good because it means that I'm trying something. And a lot of people will literally design their lives to not be disappointed because they, they're they like, well, you know, I won't try that. I won't even chase a curiosity because I don't want to be disappointed, but I'm in the game. So I'm willing to accrue that point. So Things like that, I think mindfulness is all about logical incentivization for yourself, incentivizing yourself in some way, whether it's through something goofy like visualizing points or trying to find a zero to 100 outcome. I think we're all like fully capable of that. It reminds me of what Sarah Blakely's dad did at her dinner table when she was growing up. Sarah Blakely's a billionaire founder of Spank. Yep. And every night at dinner, her dad would ask her, what do you fail at today? <laughs> Brutal. And if she didn't have an answer, <laughs> yeah. he would get upset. Meaning the purpose of life, the purpose of that day was to fail at something. Yeah. Because if you fail at something, that's growth. Yeah. And if you can reframe that in your head as failing equals good, because that means you're trying something that is pushing you further. And eventually those failures will lead you to a higher place. Then you are going to win yeah. at more things. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I love that. I'm sure at the time she didn't understand the the value of that because that's like no one wants to hear that, but it's so freaking true. Like in broader speaking, it's like the idea of contrast, right? If you think about anything good in life, what you want, a great partner, uh, standards, boundaries, dreams, goals, aspirations. The only reason we have those is because likely in some sense we have contrast of which was the opposite of that. Like you didn't wake up one morning and have a boundary in place. You likely created it because previously you were walked over or you accepted something that was beneath you. And then you're like, well, I need to create this boundary. The contrast gave you that. It's the same with like, I I have a soundbite that sounds painful. It's the people who hurt you helped you. And of course we're not giving people credit in that sense but they get that the contrast from a negative experience of someone gave you the reason to hire your standard or a job that drained you gave you the reason to never work at a job like that ever again and you went out and created your company things like that like we it's the toughest thing in the world because contrast comes with so much potential pain um and you know 
distrust and all these different things. But if we can look at it in exactly the way you just described, I think it's so powerful. There's a lot of, I, I forget who I was talking to, some some VC guy, but a lot of VCs nowadays, like they want to see failures on your resume. Otherwise they don't really want to even talk to you. And I, that might just be a, a marketing tactic, but it's like, it's, it's true. It's like for a business partner, I want to work with a business partner who has failed a couple of times. Hopefully not every single time because <laughs> then we start getting into a bad track record. But like, sh- let's see some else. Let's see what you did with those. And, and I believe if they did something with it, it's only, you know, up from there. Well, the truth is that everyone's failed. And if you're willing to put the failure on the resume, yeah. it shows your openness and yeah. you're not willing to shove it. Yeah, down. I'm better. I and mean, you, you're honest. Yeah. What do most, since you talk to so many women in their 20s in particular, like what do most 20 year old and women in their 20s, what do they get wrong about dating? Well, I'd say even before dating, and it's not, it's not just women, men do it too, but I, I think it's 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 definitely excuse women is like being too male centric too male focused too too relationship focused let's let's say that this isn't a man versus woman thing it's it's thinking that a relationship is is the thing it's the thing to validate them it's the thing they need to do otherwise they're falling behind and it's the thing to give them purpose and i never bash on anyone who says no i just want to be a good mom a good dad a good parent that's great some people truly are on earth to do that and to to be great compassionate caregivers that's great uh i'd say the people that aren't that i i just see it a lot again a lot of rushing a lot of defining oneself by their relationship status and uh it you know it is tough for women there are different biological and sociological pressures that just aren't there for men it's easy for me to be like who cares if you're single in your 30s like it's, it's a different story but i think the 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 symptom of that rushing is just a lot of poor decision making when it comes to to dating and i'd say the majority of it comes from lack of clarity that's lack of clarity in a relationship that is lack of clarity from your partner that is the, the most common question i get from women they're like yeah, i've been dating this guy for a while and i just don't know what he wants i'm like how is that possible how are you dating someone you don't know what they want and no one's a bad person for finding themselves in that situation literally a situation ship um but it's everything we just talked about. The reason they're there is because they don't want to speak up and find that the answer is that that person isn't serious. And so they just persist in this, in this context. So I'd say the biggest thing is, yeah, is that lack of, lack of clarity. Cause you, you, you do a couple cycles of lack of clarity and you wake up and yeah, you're four years later. So it's like, it can be a time suck and energy suck. It could be a morale suck. We'd like, so I, you know, the, the commentary I always come back to is encouraging women to to speak to their intention and ask for intention around their partner. Of course, easier said than done. But, you know, I just, I, I think it is looking back, you know, not asking for clarity only keeps you in an ambiguous zone for longer. And that's very unlikely to deliver the outcome you want, even if it's an outcome you're rushing towards, but at least you have clarity around it. Well, just from like a guy's perspective, I feel like whenever I've been ambiguous in any way, it's like, I don't want to actually be in that relationship. Right? It. It's like, but it's hard probably for the girl's perspective to want to like confront that because they're like, yeah. well, you know, maybe he'll turn around yeah. or maybe he'll, yeah. but it's just like, I don't want to confront that thing yeah. in that moment. So, so you have two people who don't want to confront the thing. Yes. So like the perfect storm. So again, it's, it's human nature and like no one's bad for this, of course, but it's so common. But it, what's so fascinating is that as I've, grown up in a sense as i've become more mindful it's like i can look at a situation and be like i know this is not going to lead to a relationship and so i'm done like just cut it off immediately yeah and my the ability to go from that thought to actually action on the part of like no i'm not doing this because this is not leading me to the future that i want yeah has become quicker yeah as i've gotten older and doesn't it feel better so much better so that, that my conscious feels so clean yeah and even though it's easier to do the former it feels better to do this so like that's why like when i think about mindfulness and men or women and everything it's like mindfulness a lot of the times is doing the thing that feels good not the hedonistic thing that feels good but the honest compassionate thing that feels good that might be difficult or uncomfortable but a lot of time it, it's that simple like that's the incentive you you need to give yourself not hoping a relationship will fizzle out or she'll never bring it up or you know you just, she'll lose her phone and you just never talk to her again like because let's be real it's all a lot of guys operate I, I was in a relationship in my 20s like we dated for a while and somewhere in the, in the middle, I realized that it wasn't right for me, but I did not have the courage to break up with her. And so I just kind of emotionally withdrew and then she broke up with me. I was like, oh, finally success. But that was just so backwards and so wrong 
but so many men, women, everyone does that because it's easier. It's easier. I know that there's a lot of young men listening to this podcast right now. What do you think that who are so a man who's in that situation, who's in their twenties and is dealing with that of like, they know it's not going long-term the place that they want to, they've kind of been pushing it off. What should they do? And what should they say? Obviously doing is, is the obvious thing, like just break up with her and like, yeah. but like, how do you actually get to that point? Well, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of time for men, it's like, you know, there, everyone always dunks on masculinity and how masculinity is bad and you know, this, that, and the other. And yeah, of course, of course, of course, there's elements of masculinity that are bad that have become hyper-masculine that are bad. But I think at certain times we can tap into our masculinity for compassionate outcomes. It's like, if you're in that headspace and you're all wishy-washy and you're like, ah, I just really don't, this isn't for me, but I don't have the courage. It's like, that's the scenario where you man up and you stand the fuck up and you just do it. You be a man and you do it. Like that's the time where you step into your masculine energy or whatever you want to call it. That's the time you do it. Like, and, and then there's times where you don't do that when you're like listening to a woman or you're trying to provide support, like then you don't, but like in instances like that, that's the time to like really capitalize on and, and do it. And that also was like, you know, I don't know. I just, I know a lot of men who are single and they're like, yeah, I kind of want a relationship. I kind of don't. I was like, do you or don't you? Cause the, there was a soundbite that I saw the other day. I was on Twitter. It was like, for men, for men, it's the right time. For women, it's the right guy, right? That's how eventually you get in the right relationship, right? And I was like, man, ooh, that's a, that's a brain buster. For men, it's the right time. For women, it's the right guy. And I'm like, I can't really argue with that because, and I mean, I can, but I, <laughs> for a, for a lot of men, it's literally the right time in their life. Like if it's, namely the opposite. If it's not the right time, they're going to, they're going to find every excuse to not make it work. And I think that's so true. So it's for, for a man, it's like figure out where your head's at, man. Is it the right time or is it not the right time for you? And I think if it's not the right time, you could certainly be open to the right person to make it the right time. Like I've never been a big fan of like right person, wrong time. I, I do think that the, the right person will make it the right time. But like, if you, if you made up your mind, for instance, that it's not the right time, then why are you still doing things? Why are you on dating apps? Why are you going on dates? Like, don't be a hypocrite to yourself because it only leads to scenarios where it doesn't feel good. Yeah. So do it for other people. Let's let's be let's be real noble and do do don't you know, do these things for other people. But also don't do it for yourself or do it for yourself. Do the thing that respects yourself. Have an intention and follow through. I think that's a man's greatest power and suit is you can set a game plan, you can go out and you can do it. But to have a game plan that is at odds with what your mentality is, namely, I'm not ready or I'm not looking for a relationship, but then you're still going on dates, like pick a lane and then go down that lane or pick an opposite lane, but like at least pick one. Yeah. I think what mindfulness does is it helps you get more in alignment with your thoughts and your actions. A lot of the times we're crazy people in the sense of we'll think something and act a completely different way. Yeah. Like you described yeah. so eloquently, but it's like your ability for your thoughts and your actions to be in alignment is actually what creates a skillful liver or a successful mm. human being. Mm. They have, yeah. And it's the, like mindfulness, like I, I talk a lot, I, like in my, again, how I define it, like mindfulness is not just self-awareness. Mindfulness is not just being mindful of how you feel. Like it can't be because to your point, you could say, I feel this way. Oh, well, and then go and do the opposite. What's the point of that? If your actions are in contrast to that, what do we do with that that insight? What do we do with that awareness? It, it doesn't really mean a lot. So for me, it's like my mindfulness is self awareness, but it has to be more than self awareness. It has to be honesty. So because again, you could be aware of something, but you could not. You could do sub, do everything under the sun to not address it or evolve through it. And then honesty says, okay, now we're going to get to the core reason behind it. But even then, like you could be honest with yourself on a great sunny day, but then that honesty might be very different from a Tuesday when it's raining and you're in your feelings. It's very different. So we have to find a way to break the ice even further. The simplest way I've ever found is with the word why, W-H-Y. I think breaking down mindfulness to that level is where you get to the bottom of your real shit. You, and you really push yourself to ask yourself why and answer it frequently. And not just when things are bad, but when things are good. I mean, that's why I'm so leaned into journaling. Journaling is the ultimate proof that you have answers to your questions, to your frustrations, to your ambiguities, and you have the tools to surface answers. But if you're not asking why, what does self-awareness give you?
it's quiet in here. I think I don't I, I don't know what it gives you. I mean, of course, it's important to be self aware. Like you can't you, you can't uh, evolve through an insecurity unless you say, okay, listen, I am insecure or I feel insecure. Of course, that is, any therapist will, will tell you that step one is is radical honesty, is radical self awareness. But it has to take another step where you can one get to the root cause, and that's why therapy is great from con- from conditioning and adolescence to all those different things. And then why I have found is the ultimate transition then to actions. If we're not asking why, then you're just kind of sitting in this space of feelings. And again, feelings are good. You got to feel what you feel. You got to feel, feel it to heal it or whatever the cliche is. But if actions don't follow, then, you know, what do, what do we do it here? But yeah, your quote is, or maybe someone else's quote that you took is, you can't heal from what you don't feel. Yeah. And I wrote that. Down. Same thing. When you said, it, I was like, oh my God, that's so yeah. brilliant. Yeah. But on the on the why question and particularly with journaling i'm curious what are some of the best prompts you found that have helped people become more self-aware i know obviously why and mm-hmm. literally asking the question why is going to get to that place but do you have any other prompts that come to mind because i'm obsessed with questions yeah, yeah 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 i mean the yeah the the whole thing about questions in life is like we're also focused on answers right I am, I am working hard. I am doing my best to go out and find answers that are true to me to create my life. But how do you find an answer? You ask, you have to ask yourself a question. I think we, we skip that step. We absolutely skip that step. Um, I, I mean, the, the prompt that I always do in my journaling sessions that I've included in a lot of different journals is it's an exercise I call, I'm the kind of person who, um, and it's basically in response to the words that we use are really important when it comes to how we describe ourselves, how we think about the world. And I have found myself included that when it comes to questions like, what do I want or what's my goal in life? The majority of times people say, I just want to be happy or, or I'm, right now I want to be successful or I want to be confident or I want to be fulfilled, right? Adjectives. Um, and that's great, of course. I would never say that's a bad goal. Uh, I think a more evolved version of that is to do an exercise on the kind of person who, and then you describe that with verb statements, verbs that will make you happy, successful, confident, fulfilled, and so on and so forth. Not only for the practical reasoning that actions make you a certain way, adjectives don't make you a certain way, right? But also because I think about human robot mode here. If my goal in life is to be happy, I want to be happy. Well, happiness, of course, is how do you define happiness? Happiness is ultimately at the whim of other people and randomness. So there's going to be so many days where I'm not happy. If I've aligned my focus and my goal and my truth on being happy on the days where I'm not happy, I'm going to start to blame myself. And you have enough days in a row where you're not happy, well, you might start saying things like, I'm not a happy person. I'm a failure. I'm this, I'm that. Human nature. Again, we're talking about earlier, self-preservation. Like the labels we put on ourselves provide the the guidance for our reality. So that's why like, I'm really not big on adjectives in that sense. This is, it sounds very weird that I'm just focusing on words, but coming back to a truth like, I'm the kind of person who, and then you back it up with verb statements. Not only one does it show you the power of actions to create verbs, to create adjectives, but two, uh, it also can give you someone some pride. Like if I sit down, if my goal is to be successful, and then I sit down and say, okay, well, I'm the kind of person who always answers emails on time, who volunteers to go first, who shoots his shot whenever he has an idea, who's willing to put in an extra hour at work, whatever. I'm like, well, well, shit, this is kind of cool because I'm doing these things. And I've set these other goals that I'm doing. So I'm, I'm, you're, you're amping yourself up a little bit. So I think it plays a lot of different roles. And also if you're doing it for the first time, it can give you clarity on what to do in order to feel a certain way, as opposed to trying to think yourself into thinking a certain way. So yeah, I'm just big on words. And I think an exercise like that, um, and I, and also I think James Clear has a whole chapter on habit building, you know, habit building is about identity, you know, creating an identity around, around the actions, you know, instead of, I want to be a healthy person. It's not I'm the kind of person who, you know, does, does this and hydrates this way. It's like, it's the same concept. Um, verbs. Yeah. <laughs> verbs. Well, it's isn't... about what you do because what you do allows you to be fulfilled at the end of the yeah. day, even when you don't feel like doing it. But if you can actually hold up to that identity, it allows a level of freedom from like, oh, I didn't even want to do this thing and I did it. And yeah. now I'm fulfilled. I, I did it. And it, it's another layer. Yeah. And I, I'm so like if if anyone ever asks me like what my goal is in life, I always say I just want to be proud of myself because I'm convinced that anything else will come from that. If I'm proud of myself, then I'm likely doing the things that will make me successful or happy or at peace or more specifically have a top podcast or sell a million books. Like I will likely get to that if I'm proud of myself because to be genuinely proud, of course, we have to be honest with ourselves to be genuinely proud of ourselves. That means we're doing the things we say 
we're going to do. We're doing the, the things that we wrote down on our to-do list. We're taking out the trash. If we notice this in the corner, like I'm big on little shit like that. Like if there's dishes, I'm going to do it. Even if I don't want to do it, because I want to be proud of myself, little things like that. And that's where self-esteem comes from. Self-esteem and pride are, they're, they're, they're twins. Um, it, it comes from those things. So, you know, these are very, very simple topics that we're talking about here, but I think sometimes people hearing it in slightly different ways could be for the 50th time could be like that little thing that can convince them just to try something different or look at their life in a different way. And then voila, big, big change, big growth, whatever it may be. Absolutely. What's something that's making you proud today? Today, uh, I, I'm about to launch something that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. It's something that I put off for a long time and I made some decisions today, uh, on the, on the thing. Uh, I won't say what it is just yet. Cause I'm not sure when I'm going to release it, but, um, it's something that I, I have talked myself out of doing for a long time. Um, like, Oh, why, why would anyone buy this for me or who am I to enter such a crowded, crowded space? Um, so I'm, I'm proud of myself for getting to this level. Well, I think that a lot of people are dealing with some form of that in their own way, yeah. in, in some facet of their life. So how did you get over those steps? Was it just time or how did you do it? Uh, it was time certainly, but eventually it was just going, putting my shoulder down and running through the door. Like that's why like batting up, but uh, honestly, and not for men, it, it's just, Whipping it's, up. it's act, it's verbing up. Yeah. It's just like be, it's like. It's just like frustrating yourself enough that the the only next step can be action from you. Where if you want, if you're going to think about it anymore, you're going to drive yourself crazy. And obviously, you don't want to get to that point where you've you've filled your cup so much with frustration. But I think a lot of mindfulness is just like how can you incentivize yourself to to do something. I mean, I remember talking. I uh, when I was launching my first journal, I was working at my day job. And I was talking to Austin, who's one of the co-founders of Morning Brew. And um, shout out Austin Reef. Shout out Austin. Uh, also shout out Alex. But shout out Austin in this in this instance. And he, I forget what he said, but I was, remember I was hiding in a conference room at my corporate job because he had agreed to like talk and we were just like shooting shit. And he said something about like, how are you going to monetize? He was like, oh, like, like what are you going to release a journal or something? And I was like, oh, why would anyone buy a journal for me? I like routed off like 10 names, like Tim Ferriss journal, the five minute journal. Like, why would anyone buy a journal for me? And I, you know, I always remember him, you know, being so uh, disappointed in that answer. He's like, just because it's a crowded space doesn't mean you can't make it your own. Or just because it's a crowded space doesn't mean you can't own a quarter of a percent of it. Um, and I always remember that. I'm like, man, that's so true. I've wasted so much time talking myself out of something just because it's a crowded space or a lot of people are doing it or there's people that are better or this or that and I was so fired up in that moment that I just went and did it um following that so like if you can get your hands on some good perspective like that I think that that's helpful of course but I do think we talk ourselves out of the things that we've seen scale like particularly in business like if you know there's a million people doing something I think we're we're a lot of smart people are averse to doing because like how, how can I swim in that lane if the pool is already full and that I just don't think that's a good mindset for one I obviously there's practicality to be applied here too it's not as simple as as that but just because other people are doing it doesn't mean you can't do it in your own flavor there's how many podcasts are there there's a million bazillion podcasts these days you could do it with the smallest point of uniqueness in the most consistent way like there's little things that can set you apart so I think you know sitting down and identifying the fear for one, what is the, what is the reason that you keep coming back to that you're talking yourself out of it? And then try, as we've been talking about, what would, what would the opposite of that be? What would be the opposite of talking yourself out? What would be the thing to talk yourself into it? Now let's, let's examine that. Let's break that one down even further. Can we break that down into actions? I'm the kind of person who maybe something like that. Um, you know, where, where it's, much easier to talk ourselves out of things than into things. It's like, I always say it's, it's easier to identify our not enoughness than it is to identify our enoughness. Again, it's just how we're wired. But I think journaling therapy, self-awareness backed by why and action, like we can, we can really get to the bottom of those things. So start there. I love your example of the journaling and specifically because the journal represents a point where you, it sounds like you're hesitant to do it at the start. And then it, I don't know if this is right when you launched it initially, but you launch it and it doesn't get the response that you want. And then instead of giving up or saying, I'm not the type of person who can sell a journal, Tim Ferriss already got that <laughs> space. You're like, well, 
how can I make this more appealing to people? Yeah. And you mentioned this in a previous podcast and it was such a helpful way for content creators or people who own businesses to think is like, how can you make it more specific or identify triggers more? Yeah. Yeah. You know the story. Yeah. So, I mean, even after I got through that imposter syndrome and launched it, it didn't do well. Like I lost money on the first round. I launched it on Indiegogo and it was January, 2020 and it did not do that well. I was like, ah, crap obviously fulfilled all the Indiegogo orders and then I stole like 2,000 extra journals sitting around. I was like, man, like what an L. I've got all this extra inventory. But then, yeah, this is exactly that. I sat down and I was like, I'm going to give this one more try. I'm going to, you know, refresh the branding, refresh the marketing, refresh everything. Um, you know, from a very specific point, I leaned less into here's something that will help you be happier. Because again, everything we're talking about, I don't think that's a great goal. And I also think consumer wise, it's not that enticing. Like, Shouldn't everything make you happier that you're buying, even if it's a sandwich or a stick of gum? Technically, is like that that that's not going to do the hook uh, well enough. Any marketers, obviously, being like, yeah, duh. Uh, so I really leaned into the specific value that the prompts could have. A lot of which I had created around trigger points, but didn't lean into that for selling the the journal for some reason. So namely around breakups, around self forgiveness, around these things that are literally holding us back. Like, what's a more palpable topic for someone? I want to be happier or I want to heal from a breakup or I, you know, I want to be more successful or I want to, you know, get past, um, you know, imposter syndrome, like these, these things that I think people can lean into much more trigger. So I leaned into that and that's where things started to go, uh, much better. Like I sold, like I sold, I remember I sold like 1700 or something through Indiegogo. And then in the next like 18 months, I sold like 320,000 of them. <laughs> And, and again, I don't, I don't, I'm not a, I'm literally not trying to brag on that. I think a lot of that was, uh, COVID people were really craving mindfulness products. Um, and I learned a lot and did a lot of advertising as well, but uh, I think a lot of it was due to the fact of, you know, actually thinking, sitting down and thinking about what is the actual value of something, um, both from my perspective and the perspective of a consumer and actually leaning into it. But the whole full circle was. You know, you're going to run into a wall from day one when you talk yourself out of things. Then you're going to likely run into another wall when you launch and things don't go well. And then probably a couple more walls when things don't all go the way you see. I mean, I spent a lot of time on Twitter uh, as an entrepreneur and e-commerce guy myself. It's just everyone is always beating their heads on a wall. Even the most successful guys in the world, even the eight-figure, nine-figure companies, they're all, it's just L after L after L. It's, it's, it's what you do with that that sweet, sweet contrast that uh, <laughs> that will dictate what comes next. Well, it's it's so funny, uh, you know, that you've taken those L's and created W's from them. I'm curious, from you've been in the podcast world since 2014, and so in in some respect, it's like you've seen so many people come and go. What have you found to be, from looking back now, ten years? It's like what what are the common elements between the winners in people who have been in the podcast game? Well, I'd, I'd say the easiest is consistency. We were, we were jamming on it before about, you know, the average person quits after like six episodes or something. You know, imagine, imagine quitting after taking your first six, six steps or something like that. Craziness. Like if you, if, if you sit down and you're like, I want to be a podcaster or I want to create an impactful podcast. First of all, have a why behind it. That's not just, you just want a title, but we'll sweep that, have that. Then you have to commit say 20 episodes, 50 episodes, whatever makes sense for you. If you're doing two a week, then do 50 or do 100. Say, I will do this twice, twice a week for a year. And then do not allow yourself to quit until you get to that that point for one. You have to set a goal like that. If, you're, if your uh, you know, boundary for when you'll allow yourself to quit is ambiguous, then you'll just quit whenever it gets tough. So I think you have to define that for yourself for one. Um, for two, I mean, I, I think I do think all the cliches are true. Authenticity and relatability is, is so important. I really do think the the day and age of like experts are not over, of course, because I love Dr. Huberman. I, I love a lot of those guys. But I think we're seeing a turning point when it comes to people consuming content. I mean, look at TikTok, of course, like people want relatability. They want to learn something new. They want someone who can hold their own, of course, in a conversation and have value to add, but they want it from a relatable person. They don't want to be lectured on these things. They want someone who has gone through it, is going through it, and who has an articulate thing that can help them, bar none. I mean, that that's it. So for me, I've always leaned into only talking about things that I not necessarily know, but have close relationship to or close observation with or firsthand experience with. And I think the top podcasts that I've seen always draw in their their personal relationship to it, um, their personal experiences instead of just theory. I think that's so, so important. 
Um, and then, yeah, too, I mean, I, you know, of course, giving people a reason to come back every time, um, you know, I think that the top podcasters ask people to support them. Like, I, I think, so, again, it's about shooting your shot. Like, if you don't ask people to share, less likely to share. If you don't ask them to rate and review, they're less likely to do it. It's crazy. People want to help you. I, I've noticed in the past yeah. 20 episodes, I've done 325 episodes, but it's only in the past 20 that I've been like, yo, share the show. Yeah. And it makes a huge difference. Yeah, it absolutely does. It's you can look it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's some psychology around, you know, the people who want to support you, you asking them a favor makes them feel closer to you. And in fact, I do think that's a thing. Um, yeah, people want to support the people that help them. And, you know, I, I've, I get some crazy DMs from people who have helped me in various ways over the years who never knew them. I never even knew they existed. And we've never DM'd before. And I've got a DM and they're like, hey, uh, I listen to every single episode since 2018. I'm a producer for Good Morning America. I want to come on. I'm like, yeah. But you and I would never know. It's not like this person has been in my DMs like applauding for me. And then you have those people as well who are also eager to help. So, uh, yeah, bring the personal element into it. Like I always, it's small little things, but like being like, hey, like it would mean a lot to me if right now while you're listening, you can give the show a rating and review because this, here's what it does. And here, and here's why. And when you do, if you could DM me and, and so, tell me you did, I want to thank you personally. Little thing like that. Like you talk to some of the big boys that do the things that don't scale, do that, try that. Um, I did it for, I still do it. Every single episode I always ask because <laughs> it works. People want to help you. You heard Case share the show if you make <laughs> yeah, this far. There it is. Let's, let's hit double hit him. Please share, <laughs> rate and review. Uh, I like to end these podcasts with a challenge for people. A challenge points to the place in your heart you believe people could take the information that they've learned or something we haven't covered and do something with it because you can get, consume this, but take some action from it. What should you challenge people to do? I would say two things. One is a little loftier and one's more practical. I'd say, the, I'd say the first thing, like we covered a lot of great topics. I think this is really, really good, um, particularly around verbing, uh, around the words we use, around how we can get more practical with mindfulness and not just keep it like a, a theory thing. I think the question that I would ask people is like, given this, given our ability to have insight into ourselves and use insight to create more hopeful conclusions, what is one one way that you could prioritize how your life feels to you instead of how it looks to other people? That because that I was so, gonna I was gonna bring up a second point earlier when we were talking about the absence and the presence, but like that's my thing in my life. How can I prioritize how my life feels to me instead of how it looks to other people? Because there are probably so many things that we're doing that we're chasing that we're beating our heads against the wall because of in order to look good to other people to look good on paper. Doesn't make us bad people, but is there a way? listener to come back to to doing things that feel good to you compassionate things healthy things of course what would those be i would really encourage people as a journal prompt what, what would those be and then follow up a journal prompt okay given that i'm the kind of person who and then boom we just connected a feeling with actions that will likely get you there and then let's do monthly check-ins and make sure those actions are relevant and moving the needle and let's have a great time and journaling would be the final answer because that's they're all they're all tied together so i would i would say that well, it's so fascinating because we live in a world today that, and I'm sure in the past as well, where we are we put on a pedestal the things that we are seen. Everyone is putting on their best face to be seen a certain way. And it's like, how could you, that's an external thing. How could you make the game a little more internal? Yeah. And that's why I love that prompt that comes up again and again. Feelings versus being seen in a certain way. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, we can probably go on and on about mimetic desire which is why do we even want to do things in the first place well the the truth is we didn't we are borrowing it from other people yeah. and the most freeing thing in life is to finally say you know what i've borrowed that that was never true to me in the first place but this is and we're going to go with this and i think journaling as a as a means of introspection that can encourage action is the ultimate um catalyst for those kinds of thoughts absolutely so where can we send people to buy one of these yeah, you can get one of my journals, newmindsethudis.com. You can get someone else's journals. I, I don't always even try to plug my mouth. I think any form of journaling, I think mine give really hard-hitting questions because I think the value of a good journal is the right questions, um, the right mix of prompted and unprompted, and that's kind of my thing. But any journal that gets you in an honest headspace where you can then decide actions that follow, you're going to be you're gonna be in a good place. Love it. And podcast, New Mindset, Who Dis, anywhere else we should send people to connect with you. Case that Kenny on Instagram. There, I won't shut up about my stuff, but I appreciate everyone regardless. I love it. It's a great Instagram account. Go check him out. Go follow this man. Thank you so much for spending time. Thank you, dude. This is great. Loved every moment of it. Yes, sir.